Welcome back to the latest installment of Critic Proof. I'm your host, Alyssa Rosenberg, the critic for Think Progress and the television columnist for Women in Hollywood. And I am joined today by one of my favorite people to talk to about this subject, or really any subject when it comes to television, Emily Nussbaum, the TV critic at The New Yorker. Welcome, Emily. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are here on the occasion of a terrific piece Emily published in The New Yorker this week, uh, about a project near and dear to my heart, which is reclaiming sex in the city and really reclaiming its sort of lost position in the golden age of television. And Emily, your argument is that um, Carrie Bradshaw falls sort of firmly into the anti-hero canon that we've come to know and love, or if not firmly, uh, fits into it in her own particular way. Um, yeah, you know, no, that, that, that is, I mean, to me, it's an important distinction because I realize it's sort of a tricky concept for people sometimes because they're like, how is Carrie Bradshaw an anti-hero? I mean, she definitely, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a comedy. It's a romantic comedy. It's a, it's a different generic setting, and she has totally different qualities than a lot of the characters that people think of as traditional anti-heroes, Tony Soprano and Don Draper. But I, I really do think that the way that she has a relationship with the audience is the same as the relationship that anti-heroes have with the audience. And her flaws are feminine flaws rather than the masculine flaws a lot of the male anti-heroes have. But I think that it does that classic television thing that's been happening in the last 15 years where a show challenges the audience to identify with a character and then makes them feel a sense of guilt, anxiety, and collusion about how they feel identifying seeing the character as a mirror. So do you define an antihero? The working sort of the working definition that I've been using in my work for the past couple of years is an antihero is someone you root for even though you're not supposed to. A hero is someone you root for and you are supposed to. A villain is someone you root against and you're supposed to root against them. Um, so does that sort of roughly correlate where you're coming from? I want to make sure that we're on the same page here. I mean, to a certain extent, I, I do think that, that you know, it's funny because when I think about it, I think Carrie Bradshaw, it's almost the opposite because the, with Carrie Bradshaw, she's in what amounts to a sort of a experimental approach to the romantic comedy. In romantic comedies, you're supposed to root for the main person, but uh, Sex and the City puts you in a position where the main character of the romantic comedy you're watching, you approach with that uh, expectation that they be your heroine and that they mm. be the, and instead they start doing something else to you, which is making you feel a sense of discomfort at your identification with them. That's not exactly the same as what you're describing with sure. antiheroes, but I do think it has a relationship with it because, you know, in an ordinary sort of a superhero drama or something like that, or a drama with just a wonderful guy who is doing good right. things, you would feel this excitement, this identification with him because he's, he's actually doing the stuff that you would love to be able to do. You're sympathetic with him. And in anti-hero shows, it's not that he's a villain. It's actually that the bad things he does are things that you feel a sort of titillation and excitement about. And that's what creates the tension. I mean, I think the hard thing about this is that there are all sorts of ways to define it. But to me, the central thing is how does the audience react? How does your audience react to the person in the show? And I think it needs to be distinguished both from villainy, where you might watch somebody who's just a bad guy and be excited by what they're doing, and also from just complex, flawed characters. And I I do think with Carrie Bradshaw, it sort of falls into both categories, because it's a show about four women. And the four women are... They're complicated, because they're real people, but they're also very stylized and allegorical, and they are complex and flawed characters. But with Carrie herself, I actually think that there's something a little bit beyond simply being a complex character. I think she does represent in this primal way women's worst anxieties about the things that they might do or the ways that they might act. Uh, You know, needy, self-centered, sort of melodramatic, uh, you know, a a lot of different things that Carrie does. And and she actually does bad acts, like she cheats on Aiden with Big. Um, but I, I think it, I think that that's the complicated question about it. I mean, I think I think that it, it's always difficult to compare, you know, a comedy and a romantic comedy to a drama. They just function in different ways. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that's been difficult about Sex and the City is the show sort of seems to have bifurcated in a lot of ways, and I think more so in certain ways than your typical anti-hero drama. Um, you know, Tony Soprano just to go back to the sort of wellspring or the man who ate Carrie Bradshaw to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, uh, 
I mean, he probably could have fit her somewhere in that book. But so Tony Soprano is both a bad man who, you know, can be sort of sexy and charming and funny, but you wouldn't necessarily want the aesthetics of his life either, right? I mean, he and Carmela live in this sort of, you know, McMansion in suburban New Jersey that has no art on the walls and this sort of generic in some really sort of aggressive, sort of aspirational, wealthy ways. Um, and so to a certain extent, his aesthetics are aligned with his sort of morality. Um, and so you might, you know, want sort of a tiny slice of Tony's confidence or his charm or his ability to sleep with lots of attractive dark haired women, but pretty much the inside and the outside are aligned. Um, and they're intriguing, but they're not necessarily aspirational. I think uh, you know what, you know something? I have to say, viewers vary in how they, way they, they view the show, but it was apparent yeah. from reactions to The Sopranos online that many, many people did not view the show the way that you're describing it. They did Absolutely. view Tony as aspirational, and not, and they didn't view necessarily like his home as, as, as tacky or arid. I mean, he owned an enormous house in a wealthy suburb. He sent his kids to private schools. He was able to give lots of fancy things to his wife. He was a thug, but like I, I actually think that there's a lot about him. I'm not saying he was literally presented as an aspirational model, but right. the fantasy of being essentially just the head of a large organization where you could get anyone to do your bidding and act out your most violent wishes is seems, sure. I mean, if not aspirational, certainly desirable in a taboo way. So uh, are you comparing it to Carrie because you're saying... Well, well, what I was going to say is that, you know, there's a difference between a show like that and the sort of obvious consumption porn of Sex and the City, where, you know, the dresses, the clothes, you know, Sex and the City could sort of drive products in a certain way. And yes, so, that's definitely true. And so I think that there are people, I mean, I do think that there are people who look at Carrie Bradshaw and identify with her or want to be with her. I don't think that is not something that exists. But I think that Sex and the City exists in a space where you could want a lot of the lifestyle trappings in the show in a fairly straightforward way, but have a complicated relationship to the characters. And I think a lot of the criticism of Sex and the City assumes that women were somehow incapable of holding those two ideas in their hands at once. Um, I yeah, I mean, I think that it's complicated because there's a lot of different criticisms of the Sex and the City. And uh, look, there is no doubt that it was a, tr a show set in a boom time in New York that captured in both a, you know, it's one of those strange things where it was both intensely celebratory and glamorizing of that wealthy Manhattan lifestyle. And at the same time, you know, if you watch the show and listen to it, it was also quite satirizing of the effects of that on the people within it. I mean, there was a lot of, right. I, I sort of, when I was rewatching the show, I was expecting it to be a lot more glamorizing about finance guys and hedge fund guys that they date, which is something I remember uh, upon first watching it being kind of confused and disgusted by, because I lived in New York at the period time. And right. I found certain things recognizable and identifiable, but I just kept thinking, why do these women want to date these Wall Street guys? I don't get it. But when I watched it again, I have to say, it has a strong level of satire about the way that people approach money. Nonetheless, it is undeniable that that show spearheaded product placement and has, a, you know, had for viewers a strong level of a fantasy lifestyle. I just think that the way that people describe that quality in the show mm. gets a little simplistic because for one thing, it, it wasn't actually, I mean, it's funny. I've been having this discussion on Twitter about the piece and it's sort of hard to make this argument, but it, it is true. It, it, it's not set in an actual fantasy universe. It's an extremely stylized and arch show where people talk yeah. in this kind of, Oscar Wilde like way and it has this allegorical jaggedness to it but I lived in Manhattan during that period and there are in fact corporate lawyers like Miranda that buy their first apartment when they get a promotion and you know high high level PR women like Samantha and semi celebrities like Carrie who lived in a rent controlled apartment and was tremendously in debt which was indicated right from the beginning of the show there's a huge yeah. anxiety about money in the show and money is dealt with relatively frequently in the show i mean i definitely understand that people feel that it's something that is presented in an uncomplicatedly sort of greedy and materialistic way but again it's it's a complicated argument to get into but 
I don't think that's actually accurate to the way that it was presented in the show. There was a lot of talk about money, and there was a well, lot and of... Was a, and there was a lot of, um, I mean, sort of consequences about money in a way that I think people who criticize the show for being consumption porn, that suggests to me that people who criticize the show along those lines have never watched it particularly carefully. Um, I mean, to me, the sort of most interesting element of all of this, and I was re-watching some of this um, a couple of days ago, is Charlotte's relationship with Trey, this wealthy doctor that she oh, marries, God. that Definitely. is so deeply based on the idea that you have to have certain things to have achieved a successful New York life. Um, you know, Charlotte kind of talks Trey into proposing to her about a month into their relationship. They don't know each other at all. I mean, he might as well be a shoe that she is buying. Yeah. And, you know, she's sort of disappointed by the way that they agree to get married, but immediately feels better when he sort of makes this gesture of buying her a Tiffany ring. Um, she registers for an extremely expensive china pattern, and it's one of those things where, I mean, he literally talks about going into debt for plates. Um, she has this hugely expensive wedding, and the relationship just makes no sense. She doesn't know him at all. They prove to be hugely sexually incompatible. And, you know, there's this sort of shattering scene uh, in the latter half of the series where Charlotte, I mean, and Charlotte quits her job to sort of be a full-time housewife because she expects what she's going to do is get knocked up and start raising her kids immediately. And um, there's this scene towards the end of their relationship when she has sort of opulently decorated this nursery for a baby they don't even have. And Trey sort of just asks her when things are going to be simple and when, and you realize that they have totally different understandings of what the relationship was. I mean, Charlotte has been entirely focused on these sort of outward markers of their success. And Trey basically just wants her to keep him company and sort of be nice and pretty. He views her as a thing too, in a certain way. And it's this really sort of scathing look at, you know, doing precisely what critics of the show accuse fans of the show of doing, which is sort of living your life as a commodity or, you know, having commodities as a substitute for your actual relations to people and your accomplishments. And the show, I mean, this goes on for six or seven or eight episodes. I mean, it's not a short arc. Um, and one of the moments that's really interesting is that it effectively ends when Carrie, who is broke and has done this horrible, you know, has broken off her engagement to this wonderful man, who, you know, bought her apartment for her so she wouldn't be evicted, has to buy it back from him, has no money, sort of comes to the realization of what her life would look like if she had to go out and get a non-rent controlled apartment. And Charlotte gives her the ring that Trey bought her yeah. at Tiffany's. You know, I mean, Charlotte sort of redeems herself from that relationship by turning an object into a gesture of human kindness. But to a certain it extent, it's all about her bailing Carrie out and the fact that Carrie has people who could bail her out. I mean, it's a very sort of ambiguous redemption. Yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated moment. I mean, I think it's a very beautiful moment when Charlotte gives her that ring. Um, there are a lot of viewers who absolutely hated that. I remember people just were enraged that Carrie thought that anyone should lend her money. I mean, the thing when talking about uh, value and commodity on the show is right from the beginning of the show, the show, in a way that seems very derived from the original Candace Bushnell essays, which are quite dark about money and people playing games, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the women regard themselves as commodities whose value is dropping because they're in their 30s. And so they consider themselves growing increasingly invisible and concerned about like a complete switch in the power game between men and women in New York. And that's the primary topic of the show. And there's an overlap between the question of what kind of life they think they want, what kind of life they think they deserve and the role in which wealthy men play in it. I mean, I think that mm. it is one of those things that I think is pretty ambiguous in the show because as smart and often searing well, compassionate to Charlotte as the show is about the fact that she is in this Upper East Side preppy way. She's from a wealthy family in Connecticut. I mean, she's very sociologically specific. Um, she gets into a marriage with Trey where, as you say, she's, she's doing casting. You know, she decides she wants to get married that year, and she does. And I, actually, I thought that was pretty emotionally realistic for a person like that. She, yeah. she looked around and she was like, this is it. I want it now. And she found somebody who matched that, and she got married to him. And the first half of their marriage, the problem was sex. And I actually think there's an amazing moment at their wedding, you know, because she tries to have sex with him the night before. It turns out he's impotent. 
And she yeah. says to Carrie just before she's walking down the aisle, after years of arguing that the whole approach to men should be to control them by withholding sex, she says, I should have slept with him on the first date. So, the, you know, their entire yeah. relationship would never have happened if she'd done that. But I always respected the fact that the show fixed their sexual problem and then established that the problem with their relationship wasn't sex. Like, they had a good sexual relationship at the point that they broke up. It really was about something else. However, the one thing I will say is that she then gets involved with Harry, who in her eyes yeah. is an imperfect match, partially because he's Jewish, partially because he's not hot in the way that she feels she deserves. And she feels like her value is very high, right? Because she's a wasp and she's beautiful. And however she may be getting older, uh, she, she feels like Harry should be lucky to have her. But... The show would never put Charlotte with somebody who wasn't wealthy. Like, there, yeah. there is a level at which the show, both realistically and in a fantasy way, knows the kind of guy that Charlotte will be with. Whether that makes it materialistic or venal or contrived or something, or whether it just frankly makes it realistic. I don't know if you remember, you, you remember the episode where she dates a guy who doesn't have money when she's inherited Trey's apartment? And she meets yes, him. Yes, and... Yeah. It's she, very funny because I it's mean, a great the episode. Guy, he's a recent, the guy's a recent divorcee, um, and the, things are going really well through dinner. She invites him back to right. her apartment, and the guy keeps saying, oh, wow, oh, wow, and ends with, oh, wow, you're a rich girl. Because yeah, people kept saying, well, why, why do they insist on dating wealthy guys? And there is this level where he walks into her apartment, and in a, in a situation that was very realistic, he starts walking around and going, oh, my God, you are rich. You are rich. <laughs> You're a rich girl. She has to like slowly steer him out using her using her descent uh, um, skills or whatever she's using. And it, it, I, I, I did think there were there were a couple of moments like that where they actually sort of address the the specific bubble that the women are in. There are a few wish fulfillment sure. things. It's like you know Steve, who when Miranda met him was a, a poor bartender who didn't have any major aspirations to make a ton of money, which she really had no problem with, but ended up being this enormous tension between them. The show narratively sends him along a path where he ends up being a bar owner, which is a pretty high status thing to be, and he's making reasonable money, I assume. And, but one, you know, of the, one of the things that... The Burger Club was also about money. I mean, there's actually a lot of direct <laughs> acknowledgments of the question about, about cross-class relationships and the statement that the women should be essentially looking for men. But three of them are financially independent, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, fairly late in the show. Carrie may be massively what? in debt, but she works for a living. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about both the Steve arc with Miranda is that part of the tension um, is, you know, because Miranda's willing to spend money on Steve. Like, she buys him a suit at one yeah. point that he eventually returns. And so that's a situation where, I mean, it's about sort of his discomfort with money and power. Um, and there's this incredibly sad episode after the two of them have broken up when, yeah. you know, they're still living together because they were together when they broke up and Steve hasn't found a new place yet. And he asked Miranda in this sort of sheepish way to come look to at the To look at the new place, and, yeah. And it's this hideous, almost unfinished basement. And he says, I'll take it. But clearly he is sort of desperate for Miranda to talk, it out of, talk him out of it mm -hmm. and to sort of convince him that he deserves a little better and to help him find it, you know? I mean, she ends up sort of circling a bunch of apartment listings. They find him a better place. You know, part of what's sad at the end of their first breakup is that he, it wasn't until they broke up that he could sort of accept some of her vision for him and that he deserved a little better than he was getting for himself. But and then, you know, of course, what, what, he goes... What, 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 what was so wonderful about that plot to me, like many of the plots in the show, you know, the show is often perceived in this, to me, very strange way, as though it's a series of um, sort of fantasy romps with no repercussions. But that was a classic yeah. situation in which, as a lot of the show is, it's actually about strongly complicated emotional situations, power dynamics, and, and strong feelings. And when they break yeah. up, as you say, she's feeling pretty upset about their breakup because she feels like she's put herself forward and he's let her down. And as ever, she's extremely bitter that she is going to be perceived as not a catch, and he's going to be perceived as a catch, which he is. He immediately sleeps with someone else. He gets a girlfriend yes. right away. And she's like, she's like, he's won. He's won. When we broke up, he won because he's a man, so he can get women easily, and I'm going to be perceived as somehow pathetic, you know, 30-something no. woman. But financially, what she realizes when she goes to the apartment, and I think the voiceover says this, she realized that there was a winner in this relation, in this breakup, and it was her. And it was her. And it was yeah. her because she has money. So, you know... And there's a helplessness 
to Steve, that's not just about him being working class, but it, essentially about this, well, I mean, it is actually about him being working class. It's, it's simply about the fact that he doesn't have the money to reinvent his life in Manhattan the way that she much more easily can. And the show is often balanced in that way, in a way that I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reconstruct its reputation, and it's one of those things I think it doesn't get credit for. Um, yeah. is it, well, it's, it's not about easy It's also lessons. interesting. I mean, it's also interesting. So both Charlotte, both Charlotte and Carrie end up with men who have more money than they have. Um, yeah. And we talked a little bit about uh, Miranda, but one of the things that's interesting about the final season of the show and the first movie, which I actually think is quite good and will defend at considerable length, is that um, the person that Samantha ends up partnered with is, as is the case with Miranda and Steve, someone who's much lower status than she is yeah. initially. Um, you know, he is a waiter who she sort of through force of will and her professional contacts turns into a giant movie star. And the reason they break up, you know, sort of in the, in the first movie is that she's found out that she, you know, once she has gotten him to this incredibly elevated place in Hollywood, she's literally spending all of her emotional and sexual and professional energy on making him happy. Um, you know, her career has almost turned her into a housewife and, um, they end up breaking up in part so she can focus on her relationship, but to a certain extent because her work is done. You know, I mean, there is, has been this discussion that Samantha is more of a gay man than is an actual woman, which I think is uh, sort of unfair to a certain degree. But, you know, it's a really interesting parable about, you know, a woman having this sort of display of economic and professional power and then almost having it turned against her. I, I, I see that I, I have mixed feelings about the first movie. When I first saw it, I actually sure. liked it fine. I mean, I saw the problem about the labels and love stuff and Carrie's assistant and, you know, a lot of other things. Yeah. It has soured somewhat in memory for me, but uh, there are parts of it I think are incredibly moving. Um, but uh, I actually see the Samantha thing in that movie as a little bit different because I really thought that it was pretty much about the fact that she was forced to be monogamous and in the long run she mm. was bored. And that's, and, and in the movie it was posed, quite crassly, maybe accurately for some people, I don't know, as like she was getting fat. She was getting fat because she wanted to have sex with other people and because she just wasn't made for that sort of long-term thing with Smith. I, I think it's, it's always a little difficult. At the same difficult. time, though, I mean, she's literally, she's literally at home all the time, though. I that's, mean, th no, that's she's... definitely true, but I mean, there's probably the things overlap, like she's no longer has the sort of independent, yeah. fun power life that she had. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the things are mingled together because her sort of partying lifestyle and her feeling of sexual yeah. freedom and her will, you know, desire to buy herself that ring rather than be have it bought for her. The, the yeah. Sex and money aren't distinguishable in Sex and the City, mm. but I don't think they're not distinguishable because the show is just some sort of greedhead capitalist holodeck. I think they're yeah. not distinguishable because it, that's sort of one of the major subjects of the show. Um, it's interesting because Samantha's always difficult to talk about because it, she does have a closer relationship to some sort of camp gay, heightened Mae West dynamic. She's a less mm -hmm. realistic character in an explicit way. Although, at least for women that I knew, people found her just wonderful like a lot of guys i knew some people liked her but you know she was a little horrifying to a lot of people but she's very different than the other characters like the style yeah. of characterization is different and smith is also i have to say the one character on the show that i would have to look at and go there is no guy in the universe that exists like that because there is no unbelievably handsome beautiful young actor who's also the most emotionally mature ex-alcoholic <laughs> who ever existed and who when he experiences sudden radical fame doesn't have any of the narcissistic sort of yeah. impact that it would normally have on people but to me that's not the point with the samantha story it ends up being about the fact that she gets cancer and is facing mortality and vulnerability all of the characters mm. in the show you know again a lot of times the show is treated as though they're cartoons who don't change. All of the characters on the show are forced mm -hmm. to confront their, their most difficult issues and to change because of them. And for Samantha, it's because out of self-protection and out of a sort of sybaritic love of freedom and sort of detaching herself from all those feminine necessities, she's kind of guarded herself. And then, you know, she's treated herself as though she has eternal life and sex is very central to her. And then suddenly she's ill. And so they created a guy that could demonstrate Samantha letting somebody help her and, and actually yeah. stepping up to bat. And I thought it was a pretty beautiful story, but it is hard to deny that that story is not a little more like mystical in some way. 
yeah. than the other stories on the show. But the fact that it's a little more mystical, a little more allegorical and Haydn doesn't make it not useful to me. It's a kind of TV I yeah. think deserves to be valued just as much as, you know, gritty, realistic things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about class. Um, and I wanted to sort of go back to the question of identification. Um, because I think that, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that the show's gotten this sort of sour reputation is that it's become this trope that, you know, people who like the show kind of identify with it uncritically. And I think that's, you know, that's become a critique in part because people have very cartoonish perceptions of the characters. Um, and because they think that people are sort of merely aspirational about the show. But there is something sort of funny to me, and I wrote about this earlier this week in Women in Hollywood, how it's become this cultural trope to sort of make fun of people who like Sex and the City too much. Um, who would do and that? I, <laughs> I don't understand. Why well, would... Uh, well, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, the, are we going to no, go to the newsroom thing? Yeah, I want to talk about the newsroom a little bit. Um, I want to talk about both the newsroom and girls, which are both HBO shows that you know, seem to, to a certain extent, view Sex in the City as this almost like the drunk aunt that they're anxious about, <laughs> which, you know, heralds back to some of the nastier criticisms of Sex in the City itself. Um, but so the newsroom this has had this running really strange subplot where... Um, <laughs> know, the, 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 news, the newsroom plot about Sex in the City... Is it literally um, exists at this borderline between me being horrified and me enjoying it so much that it confuses the hell out of me. Like, it's just, the, it is the craziest thing. It's like it has just an insane vendetta for the show. And he dated right. Kristen Davis, who right. played Charlotte. Well, and I feel like, I feel like, so the fact that Aaron Sorkin dated Kristen Davis kind of lends the truth to Sex and the City, right? I mean, there is this sort of realm of power couples who, yes, you know, are powerful people who run in the same environments and, you know, end up dating each other and do exist in this sort of closed little world. But so in this incredibly strange twist last season, to recap for those of our viewers who gave up hate, hate watching at some point, um, uh, Maggie, uh, a young staffer on... Newsnight with Mil Ma Will McAvoy, or whatever the show is actually called, um, has a crush on her coworker Jim, who is dating her roommate Lisa. And her, she sort of set them up because she has a crush on Jim, and this would sort of put him off limits. Um, and Jim, in an effort to learn more about Lisa's interests, took a Sex in the City tour bus of New York. And Maggie tracked him down and yelled a lot about how she's the real New York woman, and they kissed, and they didn't actually get together. And this season, it turns out that someone videotaped Maggie freaking out the, uh, and put it on YouTube, and people have now started seeing the video. Maggie and her co-worker Sloan, who I worry is in danger of being ruined by Aaron Sorkin just because I like her, go Me and too. track down the woman who made the video who turns out to be an insane sex in the city blogger played by the actress who also plays Piper's best friend on orange is the new black because the world is tiny. Um, and so it's been this very strange sort of ongoing argument that like girl, like girls who are dumb, like sex in the city. Although when Lisa saw the video, I mean, there was this very sex in the city, like moment in the newsroom last week, where Lisa kind of confronts Maggie over the video and over the fact that sort of as she put it, you know, Maggie parked Jim with her because she thought they'd never end up together right. because she actually has a somewhat low opinion of Lisa. Look, and look, to, Lisa really gave it to her, you know? To, it was to, like to, really to, I actually like that scene, by the way. It's yeah, literally I it was like great. the one scene in the show that in an unambiguous way, first of all, I love the girl who plays Lisa. I thought the confrontation yeah. was really interesting and staged in a really dramatic way, and it. it but it, it was, was like a set. But it was like a scene on Sex and the City. That's no, part the, of what makes it really interesting. It, the show is, as Aaron Sorkin himself would say, it's not like something he denies. Is very much a romantic comedy element to the yeah. to the show. I mean, he thinks of it as being in the school of old school. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what was the movie style. Um, for old style screwball? romantic comedy, screwball comedy. Screwball like he thinks comedy. of it as a screwball comedy. He loved The Office. He's based a major triangle on it in a kind of a 
a weird, terrible fan fiction version of, ironically, of of, uh, of the Office. The 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 Maggie. I, I can never remember anybody's name. But anyway, that whole triangle is clearly based on the Office, and the whole thing is about love triangles and Daffy. It's, it's all the same genetic material that yeah. Sex in the City pulls from because they're both based on the idea of romance and sex and the sort of sparky sparring between men and women is a very central thing of life. But why? But the newsroom clearly views Sex and City, nonetheless, <laughs> as an enormous punching bag. And it, it just yeah. comes up over and over again in these crazy ways. And it is it is kind of this recurrent set of Aaron Sorkin's obsessions that have been expressed in previous shows are also expressed in this. One of them is about Sex and the City. One of them is about yeah. technology. One of them is about anonymous bloggers and nobodies who go out there and do cruel sociopathic things to their betters to good, putting to things good online, which is something that, you know, uh, let's face it, it clearly goes back for Sorkin to the West Wing when he was being attacked online, and he got onto television without pity, and he fought with his, you know, foes about the value of the show and how to see it and everything, and then he created a fictional storyline on the show in which Josh was attacked by bloggers who he then called, like, a fat chain smoker in a moo-moo, like, he's always portraying digital strangers as um, pathetic sociopaths. But this is but a particularly get, strange get, feminine version of this, where he created a character who was very well played by that woman from Orange and the Black, yeah. who is from an outer borough, <laughs> sort of a nobody uh, at a laundromat, who is a Sex and the City fanfic writer who has put uh, like a YouTube video on, and then when confronted by two women who come to see her and ask her to take it down, let's face it, Anybody who was a Sex in the City fan writer, fanfic writer would probably, upon being asked by somebody to take it down, would take it down, especially since yeah. she's offered some sort of payback. But in his view, any person like that, A, is totally unfamiliar with the news. Like, if someone is a Sex yeah. in the City fanfic writer, they're going to be an apolitical moron. Also, yeah. they're going to be a freaking sociopath whose only yeah. goal is to get famous. So it's just, yeah. I think it, it's very expressive of his understanding of the universe, but what's interesting is the way that all of the sort of feminine smear against Sex and the City <laughs> has been reutilized within the newsroom as this animating kind of, like, strange story that has to be reacted against. Also, I actually, like, it's so weird to be arguing with a fictional character, but Maggie keeps screaming about how Sex and the City is inaccurate. But newsroom yeah. is set among very wealthy, beautiful people who wear exactly the kind of clothes that are in Sex and City. Like, the women are always talking right. about makeup and clothes. And Maggie is obviously not like the women in Sex and the City because she's, like, 25, right? Like, the women right. in Sex and I mean, the City are success they're successful women in their 30s. There's this weird thing that goes on that sort of conflates all stories about women as all, though all women are fungible. But anyway, well, you, well, you know, you can talk forever about this, but it's, like, a very fraught crazy thing. I sort of hope it goes on for the rest of the season because I'm kind of curious to see whether the but Sex in the City stuff keeps recurring. And one of the things I think is really interesting about sort of the newsrooms, I think you're absolutely right to cite the show's sort of obsession with Sex in the City within Sorkin's larger interests. But it's fascinating that he sort of set the show up as kind of a punching bag because I think the newsroom is obviously much more invested in the idea of sort of true love and like the purity of affection and kind of soulmates as you know it's much more invested in any of those ideas than sex in the city ever was um i mean there's this sort That's of true. you know there's this creepy idea that will's sort of obsession with mac is you know an expression of something kind of pure or real when i mean will is a sociopath right like his girlfriend broke up with him and he can't get over it and he uses that to make her miserable at work. I mean, that's a really, really screwed up thing to present as this sort of higher ideal, or at think, least, or even. I don't think you understand. I don't think you understand the show. Mackenzie McMahon, McKay, whatever you know. Like she's a lot of. She's a lot of names. She needs to apologize to him every day <laughs> for the rest of her life. And honestly, I think the show would be improved. If in each episode there was a different version of her apology, it could kind of honestly be a little like Carrie apologizing to Aiden, where she went to him, and actually it was the opposite of apologizing. She went to him and was like, you have to forgive me, you have to forgive me, and it was this sort of confrontation. I think that they should redo that scene, 
with Will and Mackenzie because you could create a lot of almost fan fiction like responses to Sex and the City. Do you think she should have to grovel on a pile of like crushed blackberries? Yes, I think that she, that's exactly. There could be like a lot of really like great humiliating things going on. I, I think it could be a really interesting part of the show. It could get a little bit, you know, slightly much more stylized than it even is. Uh, both that's the true. shows do have a lot in common. I mean, they are both highly stylized shows that don't have a pretense to realism. They they both are in fantasy right, but universes. But the defensiveness about it is very strange, considering sort of the, the newsroom's own priorities. And I also, I mean, I also think it's interesting that Girls, which is sort of a very much a descendant of Sex and the City, and even set sort of a couple years back from Maggie at 25, you know, the youngest character, Shoshana, is yeah. what, 20, 21? Um, that is a show that, again, you know, felt the need to kind of have its Sex and the City disclaimer in the first episode. And I know Lena Dunham likes Sex in the City a lot, but there was this scene where Shoshana, the youngest character and sort of the most naive one, rattles off this list of ways that she and her cousin relate to Sex in the City that are literally factually inaccurate. I mean, she says that her cousin, who is a blonde with wavy hair, has Charlotte hair, yeah. and Charlotte is, you know, a very sleek brunette. Um, you know, she talks about Samantha coming out, you know, when she goes out partying, when she is a really anxious virgin, you know, it's, and it was a very funny moment of the show, sort of, I mean, it almost felt adolescent, and I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, but it was sort of Lena Dunham saying, I'm not this thing, I swear to God, I'm not this thing. Yeah, um, it was definitely, it was definitely like an exorcism, I think they even said that, and, and yeah. I, I found it a more affectionate and forgivable use of it, because realistically, Shoshana sure. is the kind of person, you know, she, she was a pretty heightened character in the first few episodes, not a strictly realistic character, but to the level that she sort of made sense as a person, she would be a person who would kind of experience sex in the city the way that drives people crazy where the person doesn't yeah. entirely understand the show and sees it as a series of exciting blueprints for single life and Shoshana actually you know like that's a character who would do that so I actually did find it sort of like like a, a wry approach to it yeah it didn't represent what the show was but I, did, I didn't have any problem with it and the truth is one of the things that happened with girls which is you know I have this repeated thing where I keep saying uh, girls has much more in common with Louis than it does with Sex in the City. Now it does have stuff in common with Sex in the City, but the truth is, people compare all female narratives to each other. They act as though, yeah, like female characters are just fungible, no matter what kind of show they're in, what the themes are. They all have to be compared to each other, and they should never be compared to men. So I think that there was a feeling when you're producing a show that's set in New York with four women, like you have sure. to say it. But it's true that there was this level at which they were. They were trying to distinguish themselves from it. They were saying, you're but I different. Did, yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing that has made me relieved, and, you know, you wrote in your piece about the ending of Sex and the City, kind of betraying the show's um, larger yeah. project and giving in to this romantic comedy. And one of the things that was interesting at the end of this second season of Girls is that it kind of does the same thing, but suggests that the realization of, of that fairy tale is curdled um you know when big shows up and tells carry on the bridge you're the one and there's a fabulous dress and there's smooching and there's lights and there's paris um you know the show really sort of surrenders it cracks open its big gooey heart and invites us to sort of lick up the caramel inside and the ending of this season of girls you know was in sort of physical shape very similar to that i mean yeah i agree and it makes the even bigger gesture and sort of runs across town talking to Hannah on FaceTime and literally, you know, you know, big doesn't pick up Carrie. There's just a sort of sweep. Adam literally sort of cradles Hannah, lifts her off the ground. She's reduced to this level of infancy. Marnie, you know, to a certain extent gets, you know, her version of the fantasy, right? She reunites with Charlie now that he is sort of rich and famous and buzzy. Um, Shoshana and Ray break up, which is great. Um, I mean, that's sort of the best part of the whole thing. And Jess has just disappeared. But I thought girls did a really excellent job of making those moments really ambiguous and scary, even though, I mean, just like physically and shot compositionally. I, I, you know. I, look, I, I, I just, it is one of those things where a lot of time has passed since that girl finale. I still haven't made up my mind about it. I mean, I'm just yeah. a few minds about it. It really, it did. It, I, I actually enjoyed the second season. I thought it took a lot of interesting creative risks. There were some episodes that really stood out to me as just the most fantastic things ever on the show that I really loved. 
and the and yeah. there were other ones that I just thought were fascinating and 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 really just went up in these strange directions. Also, just structurally, like would focus on two characters and just do different things with the humor and the pacing and stuff like that. But the ending had a clear relationship to this romantic comedy thing. And well, sure. you know, I like romantic comedies to some extent and good ones. Um, it 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 did it really threw me off, and I. It's not the end of the show. That's one of the differences. Like, yeah. I don't know where they're sure, going from that. Course. But one thing that I couldn't help but feel while I was watching that was, <laughs> now I do sound like Carrie Bradshaw, I couldn't help but wonder. Um, it, it did feel in this odd way like they had repurposed Adam. Like, they'd made him into a really, really great, believable, complex character, and they wanted mm. to keep him around. And so now he became somebody who she should be with and who would save her in this way. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, there's a way in which I can justify it in my head, but I felt uncomfortable in a way that I can't decide was like an interesting challenge to me or whether I thought mm. it was a failure of, on the, on the part of the show to dramatize things. I actually did feel like the last episode was kind of the, the tone, the pacing or something felt really odd and scattered. And the episode before that, I thought it had been one of the best episodes ever on the show. Um, and I did understand the fact that, uh, Lena had fallen apart and essentially like was facing the thing that she most wanted to do, which was to write this book and was incapable of doing it. And so there was a yeah. level at which I thought there was a kind of power to the fact that although it was pre being presented romantically, it was kind of yeah. like the decimation of her as an artist. And I'm not saying that's a permanent thing, but it's that no. moment that any writer understands where it's just like, I am not going to get this done. Like this will, yeah. this will not happen, especially because all of a sudden, her subject matter was different. Like she'd been writing yes. about sexual humiliation and then her boss was saying, where's that? <laughs> He's like, where's that pathetic semen smeared face that I wanted in the, you know, like all he wanted was uh, like self abnegating confessionals that uh, yeah. horrible gen X bosses in a destroyed media community demand of millennials. Like, and mm -hmm. she couldn't provide that because her life had changed somewhat and she was dealing with different things and she couldn't do it for whatever reason. In that context, I think the Adam thing was a little bit different. With the with Sex in the City, they knew exactly what they were. They were satisfying the need to have a happy ending and to have the happy ending be true love. And true yeah. love on the terms of Carrie Bradshaw. Like, that was true love to her. Um, and I know that a lot of people loved it. And I didn't love it at the time, but it's a pleasurable episode. It, in the fullness sure. of time, I really do feel like there's this way in which... It changes the the picture of the show in a way that I think really harms it. Um, but well, and one of, one of but, the but you know it is a tricky thing with TV shows. It's like does the last episode then destroy everything before? I don't think so. Um, well, but, have you have you ever watched the alternate endings in the cafe that they cut for the show? No, is it with the girls gathered or what? What, what is the alternate? Yeah, ending? so there, um, so there. Are, Sex in the City, so it doesn't actually end on the bridge. It ends back in New York with Carrie explaining what happened. And they shot a couple of alternate versions of it, which I watched, I think, on the DVDs um, when I was renting them from Blockbuster, when there still was a Blockbuster in my neighborhood. And in one of them, Big Chicken's Out. Like, oh, there's a big declaration. No, that's awesome! Because that's, you know, look, I, I don't mean to rant about this, but there was an ending to the big arc in the show. Yeah. When he had a heart attack, and... They had a really beautiful, close moment while he had a fever. And then he woke up the next day, because she knows him very well. She looked at him and said, nobody else could tell. It was so subtle that nobody could see. Yeah. But I could tell that his heart had closed up. And maybe it would open up in a year. Maybe it would be in five years. Yeah. But I didn't have time to wait around. Yeah, You know, but she met the guy when he was 45, like, to present it mm -hmm. as this. So in the end, he actually came to her and was just like, psych. I, I have to say that that... Somebody somebody said this to me at the office while I was working on that piece, and I thought it was really insightful. They they just we were talking about the ending and my problems with the ending and everything. She was saying, you know, the problem with the ending was that it didn't it didn't in any way violate Carrie's character; it violated Big's character. Yeah, Big's character. Like they had done a well established presentation of like exactly why he was such a potent force in her life, what was charming yeah. about him, and what was damaged and what was unfixable, and and also just you know like treating him with integrity as a person, what his limits were, what he actually wanted. And at the yeah. end, it's the same thing as, like, When Harry Met Sally, which I've always felt was a piece of fan fiction written by Sally. Um, you know, yeah. the guy does exactly what the woman would want him to do. And to me, there are what? romances it's that I love when they end that way and just 
this is not one. I felt well, like I mean it's and it's interesting because I I you should track down the alternate endings because the scene where she explain the take where she explains that he couldn't do it, she's like very clear and resigned and not upset. She's just like. It doesn't surprise me at all, basically. Yeah. Um, I would be really, I'd be really curious for you to see those. But oh my really... god, I have to see this. I don't know why I didn't know about this. I mean, you know, at the time that they, they were planning the ending and shooting the ending, I did a piece for the New York Times about the ending, where I interviewed a bunch of women on the street, and I talked to Sarah sure. Jessica Parker. I talked to a bunch of writers for the show, and I don't know whether they were, you know, like sometimes when people are ending shows, they, they actually act like there's a big debate over the ending, and they're like, there were a lot of conversations, you know, but maybe they were telling the truth. I mean, they were like, there were a lot of conversations, but they clearly recognize that it, it's one of those complex things when you end a show like that. They, they yeah. knew they had a split audience. There were a lot of women who did see that show as just a message about single femalehood, and so some of them yeah. wanted to see... Uh, the capacity to imagine a happy ending for somebody being single and the show didn't do that and then some of them wanted a romantic ending and you know it's like you couldn't satisfy both parties and um well and i think this gets at something interesting right which is that i think a lot of other anti-hero shows have split audiences um i mean you've written about true. the way that sort of david chase wrote cleaver the um mob drama that's at the end of uh, that is part of the sixth season of The Sopranos as a response to fans who were sort of in it for the violence and seeing Tony kill people and, you know, sort of considering that and, the element and, of bad. And in fact, I would argue that the whole half, the second half of The Sopranos is a hostile response sure. to the fans who were but, responding wrong to The Sopranos, in his view. I, I agree right, with that. But that, that actually absolutely exists. Um, Lane Brown did this amazing interview with Vince Gilligan about Walter White in which Gilligan says, you know, people who think Skylar is this bitch... Who are who's holding Walt back from his like true awesome evil potential are misogynists, you know. And I, so, I think there is this strong tradition of antihero shows about men having a split audience. But for some reason, the part of the audience that is you know critical and kind of gets the message gets credit for existing. And I think that is not true with Sex in the City. I, I, I think, think you're Sex right. In the City, I think Sex in the City is a show where only the bad half of the audience. Or not, well, I, I don't want to call them the bad, bad half, half of the audience. I mean, I mean, you know, but, it's, it's you know, a problem. I think that's it's unfair. A... But the half of the audience that <laughs> is in it for the sparkle yeah. has been assumed to be the only part of the audience that exists. To a certain extent, you know, this is about reclaiming women as critical viewers of television and our yeah. reputation um, almost as much as it is the show. Yeah, and I, think, I that, think that's true. And I think that one thing, you know, you were talking about sort of the integrity of Big's character. And I think that one way in which I think Sex and the City is arguably superior to many of the um, of the anti-hero dramas and sort of associated dramas of the period is that it's very generous to and nuanced about its male characters. Um, and I would never say that Carmela Soprano or Skylar White aren't good creations, but, um, you know, I think that Sex and the City you know, had, did really, really well by its male supporting characters. And, you know, that I, is... I, I have to say, I would have to argue, I, I think The Sopranos does really well by its female characters. Yes, within I think the, that's within true. Within the context of the story it's telling. Like, I think Carmela is treated with an appropriate brutality by the show, but not because she's a, a minor character, she's treated as instrumental to Tony's story, but because yeah. the show treats her, you know, actually she's a really important character because she's a character who has much more of a choice than Tony because yeah. she is confronted with the reality of what's going on and chooses to walk back into yeah. it. And Skylar does the same thing. But those are not stories about Carmela and Skylar. And there's right. no denying that there's some kind of weird engine going on with the audience where people just hate those women as nags who are holding the main character back. But um, but as Sex and the City, I agree. I mean, I just, I'm just i just saying, I don't think that Sex and the City honors the men more than those shows. I just think it's a different genre, no, a different kind of character. It, but it never gets credit for how good the male, male characters are. That's definitely right, and true. They're, Excellent. I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, we've, we've talked some about Big. I mean, I think Steve is, Steve is this really remarkable creation, right? I mean, he is someone who's sort of financially insecure, who's not terribly ambitious, but who has this very sort of high and specific, like, you know, code of manners almost to a certain extent. I mean, when they meet Miranda, the way that he flirts with her is yeah, by sort of chastising her for being rude to him. Um, you know, he is, you know... He's this really, he, both he and Aiden are a real contrast to sort of the finance guys in the show. Um, and, you know, 
Aiden, you mentioned this in the piece that, you know, Aiden, who's carrying a sort of big romance other than big, uh, who she's with twice, who she becomes engaged to and eventually breaks up with. Um, you know, Aiden is this really decent guy. There's this wonderful, I think, also sort of anti-heroic moment. Before Carrie cheats on Aiden with Big, he is stripping and redoing her the floors in her apartment, which are just a mess. Yeah. And she says to him, because it's noisy, she says to him, I, you said I wouldn't be bothered. I'm bothered. And it's this yeah. incredibly selfish reaction to this gift that he's giving her. And then she goes to a hotel to work and Big shows up and she cheats on him. And well, Sort of, but I ha- she, you're, you're absolutely right. It's totally selfish, but... One of the things that always struck me about the entire thing is it's so beautifully set up in these very literary metaphors. I mean, all along they've treated Carrie's smoking as akin to her yeah. desire to be with Big, her desire to be self-destructive, to create just drama in relationships, and to do things that are ugly and bad for her. Um, yeah. But he's stripping her floor. Like, he's breaking down her space and her apartment. He's getting it underneath her skin. He's creating intimacy with her. He's not only doing something generous for her, but he really is just shattering the boundaries that she's put around herself. I mean, I, I know it's, it's like I'm treating them in this very intense literary way like real people, but I really thought it was the most, that, that entire situation creates the most potent combination of, of metaphors mm-hmm. where he is, he is stripping down and breaking down her apartment and all of the things that are cracked and damaged about her apartment that he has pointed out in the most gentle way and that are clearly representative of the damaged parts about her. And at well, the and moment it, that he's doing that, she she's just like I cannot take the intimacy. You were yeah. you were breaking me down, and you were in my space, and you were correcting these things. Yeah. And then she goes with big, and then after they have sex, of course, she smokes. And then the whole thing yeah. becomes well, about her smoking, and yeah. Well, and that's what Aiden when Aiden asks her if she's cheating the first time, what he means is, are you smoking again? And it's this you know sort of terrifying misunderstanding. One of the things, so there's an early episode of Sex in the City where um, uh, one of the characters meets a character that. Carrie refers to as the marrying guy, you know, this guy who sort of desperately wants to get married and have kids. Um, And Aiden is sort of a more laid back version of that, right? I mean, he sort of colonizes Carrie's house with all of his stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. He kind of, you know, moves in by proxy. He, you know, offers to do these things for her, you know, both so she'll be sort of indebted to him and so he'll have some ownership over her space. Um, And when they break up, it's in part because he is jealous of her past with Mr. Big and wants to sort of put her on lockdown. You know? <laughs> and, I mean, it's, and who could blame him since she actually cheated on him with Big and then tried to no, maintain a friendship is, with I him? Mean, but yes, it is out of insecurity. But it is an ugly... It's an impulse that's driven out of the fact that he's never really been able to forgive her. It's like their relationship yes. is not actually healthy and he's trying to sort of restore it to health. I mean, he's acting like a woman in a lot of ways, right? He's like, if I marry her, like everything will be fine. You know? Much like... You know, much like Charlotte... He's made it this goal um, in a way that, you know, doesn't necessarily accord with who Carrie really is. Um, and one of the reasons I like Steve as a character so much is that, you know, he, I think, is someone who's kind of invested in family and relationships, but he doesn't push Miranda except for the very hilarious scene after he finds out that she's pregnant where he shows up with the ring that Aiden was originally going to use to propose to Carrie that Miranda <laughs> picked out that. Yeah. that she hates. And he shows up at her door <laughs> and <laughs> proposes because he thinks it's the right thing to do. And Miranda says, no. He says, well, I don't want to marry you either. <laughs> she says, well, I know it's a borrowed ring. And he says, well, wh- where do you think I would get the money from after buying my bar? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. And, and it's this very funny sort of commentary on, like, the drive to get married because it's the right thing or it'll make everything right. Like, Steve sort of does it, and they immediately realize how foolish the idea is. And, you know, that's a relationship where Miranda actually ends up proposing. Um, They have a wedding that's very much like them. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I think think Steve and Miranda have by far the healthiest relationship on the show. Maybe. Maybe. I'm I'm thinking about it. Does Steve and Miranda have the most healthy? Well, they definitely have a healthier relationship than any other relationship that Carrie ever had. Um, Yeah. I'm thinking, do, they, do I think, I don't know, you could say that Charlotte and Harry have all these relationships. I mean, I, I like all the characters. I think all the characters are pretty flawed and can be off-putting at some periods. But with the exception yeah. of Carrie, I find all those women really pretty just likable and funny, and I just enjoy them. But I will say, 
that when I first watched the show, and by the way, I was Carrie's age when the show was on. We were talking about split mm-hmm. audiences, and there is a yeah. difference between the audience that saw it in their 30s, in their 20s, and bizarrely, as teenagers, which I can never get over that so many teenage girls watched the show. It seemed so strange to me at the time. But um, one of the things that I will say is when I first watched it, because of the style and because of the extremeness of it and because of the, the, the sort of arch cynicism that comes sometimes in their conversations, I remember hating it for the first two episodes. And then the third episode, I fell in love with it. <laughs> because the first two episodes I watched, I felt as a lot of people who don't like the show, many of whom have not watched the show, some of whom have, Um, that it was in some way just this, like, nasty... I was just like, these women resemble the women I know, but they seem so much harder, or, or, like, there's something so, like, coarse about the way they're talking about sex, or there's something like, Miranda was incredibly bitter. And then it took me a while to feel the style of it, and then to feel this incredible feeling of, like, connection and affection to the way they created those characters, to the point that you and I are talking about them like they're real people many, many years after the show was over. I mean, yeah. it's not something that I feel like a lot of TV shows have mimicked, but I feel like the show has been influential in, in many different ways. And for me, that was kind of a breakthrough for me as a viewer because there is this thing that I call the three-episode show, and some of the best shows on television are the three-episode shows. Enlightened is a three-episode show. The Wire is a three-episode show. It's not like all great TV fulfills this, but some TV requires you as a viewer to learn how to watch it because it yeah. has a new or jarring feel. And I actually feel like as old as Sex in the City is, it its alienation element is actually, to me, a strong part of its originality and appeal. And it's also the thing that I think blocks people from seeing it as anything other than a series of nasty cartoons, which is maybe the way that I would think of the show if I had stopped at two episodes. <laughs> but yeah. um, And they were early on also. And, you know, I, I remember just... Just, just watching it and, and, and feeling almost like it was a, it, it, it was in some way like I, I was I was reflected in it and it was like an insult to me or something like that and then like I you know I changed my approach to it but it is interesting the thing you say about mixed audiences because I think that's one yeah. of the hardest things about talking about TV is it's 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 a shared and individual experience people have their yeah. own impressions of shows but especially with the internet it, you know that's like true. the conversation is as much a part of the audience experience as what used to be a solo watching thing. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like Sex and the City is a show where I would sort of challenge anyone to just give it a season, you know? And I I think, well, I did a sort of informal poll on Twitter a while ago of how many people had seen it through the TBS reruns, which, oh, you know, God, really bored us on the show and reduce it. It's true. We're, we're coming up on an hour, so I will not get you started. But I think that you know, the show cannot be boulderized. Um, and I, I wish people would go back and sort of give it, just give it a season. You know, we <laughs> talk a lot today. I think it's become common understanding among television viewers that comedies take a season to settle in. And Sex and the City got there faster than that and got, you know, sort of tender and painful and specific faster than that. And I think it, I, I hope your piece leads people to give it some second chances or second watches because well, I, I hope I so it's... too. Although I don't really mind if people don't like the show. The only thing that I yeah. would like is I, I would like for people not to have, you know, they're not everybody likes every kind of shows. I mean, that's what TV is like yeah. and that's what taste is like, but there is a sort of dismissal and condescension that people seem to feel like they have a right to with a show like this. Yeah. And I feel like it's not just about the fact that it's a female show, but that's a major part of it. It has to do with a lot of overlapping things. It's dialogue. It's about sex. It's a comedy. Like, there's a lot of connected stuff. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the piece is sort of a gesture to try to reclaim the reputation of the show, but also to get people, ideally, to think critically about, you know, what gains sort of automatic prestige and what doesn't. And not necessarily to agree with me on that, but just to, just to interrogate it a little bit. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Emily. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks for having me.